All right, thank you everyone for joining us for Less Traffic, Better Places, How Do We Get There? My name's Emma Nuttall and I work for the City of Sunnyvale's Environmental Services Department. We're gonna give it just a couple more minutes before we start just to get some of the last stragglers on. Um, but while we wait, feel free to look at the slide that's up and it tells you how to ask questions with Microsoft Teams live event, um, what to do during the webinar if it freezes, and then very importantly, we have an area for feedback. You guys all should have gotten this link with the Eventbrite emails that have been sent to you, and I will also be posting it in the live Q&A area as well. So I'll give it a couple more minutes. Okay, and with that, let's get this event rolling. So I'm excited to welcome Douglas Coons, who is on the City of Sunnyvale's Sustainability Commission, to introduce our first speaker. And so without further ado, take it away, Doug. Thank you, Emma, and welcome everyone. Thank you for joining us for this rescheduled and now virtual Sustainability Speaker Series event, Less Traffic, Better Places. How do we get there? Some quick background on the Sustainability Speaker Series. The series brings renowned experts in sustainability research and policy development to share their ideas and innovations with our community. This year's theme is Community Solutions in keeping with the City Council's 2017 policy priority of accelerating climate action. This webinar is being recorded and will be uploaded to the City's website in upcoming weeks. Please take a look at the display, displayed slide to become acquainted with our webinar software, Microsoft Teams Live Event. Attendees can use the Q&A feature to ask questions at any point during the event. All questions will be addressed during the Q&A session between 8 and 8.30 p.m. We value your feedback. This is our first <coughs> virtual event, and we would appreciate your insight into whether it worked well for you. Please fill out the evaluation form after the event. The link is posted on the Q&A tab and will be emailed to those who registered on Eventbrite. Before we begin, we will hear from Michelle King, Principal Planner with the City of Sunnyvale, about the City's parking policies and plans. Michelle? Thanks, Doug. Um, thanks for the introduction. Uh, my name is Michelle King. I'm a Principal Planner with the City of Sunnyvale's um, Planning Department. My main focus, um, my two large current um, projects are working on the downtown specific plan and then the downtown specific plan is go undergoing a amendment currently and that amendment is looking at this very timely topic of parking and um, parking management and wayfinding and um, developing near transit all of those um, topics are key to looking at climate change and how we can um, be more efficient in um, not using automobiles so i wanted to invite um, the public to 
participate in the process that's going to be occurring with the downtown specific plan. And I wanted to make sure people know that there is a website on the city's um, city of Sunnyvale's website that includes uh, the current downtown specific plan amendment and its um, draft, which has policies and programs about parking and about climate action. And you can find that at sunnyvale.ca.gov um, backslash news backslash topics DSP. And on the downtown specific plan amendment page, there um, are the draft documents and will be some upcoming dates of public hearings. And at those public hearings, we will pre be presenting the results of a parking study for downtown, which has a series of recommendations that talk about improved parking management, wayfinding, um, alternative transportation. And in the downtown, there are now um, uh, uh, including the uh, active transportation improvements for bicycle and pedestrians. So it's kind of an exciting amendment and relates very directly to looking at parking reform. I also want you to um, invite you to participate in the second project I'm working on, um, which is another area of the city that includes an area plan. So the downtown um, specific plan is for the downtown Sunnyvale district. The second specific plan is for an area called Moffat Park. I'm sure you're all familiar. And Moffat Park has a specific plan that was updated previously um, in the uh, early 2000s. And we are now um, doing sort of a wholesale relook at Moffat Park and considering um, adding new uses to what is currently an office and industrial park, including um, open space, active outdoor uses and residential uses. And this is a large undertaking and will take probably um, a couple years and there will be an incredible amount of public outreach. So if you want to get in on that process, it has its own standalone website at moffatparksp.com. We will be looking at district wide infrastructure for Moffat Park, including transit, um, transportation and parking as some district wide improvements. Hopefully um, you can participate in that process and help us envision how Moffat Park can um, be a full neighborhood in the future um, with lots of activity and not as much um, traffic and um, better managed parking. So with that, um, I'm excited to hear the speaker series um, this evening, and I will hand it back to Doug. Thank you, Michelle, and uh, uh, hope that the public takes advantage of the opportunities to uh, give their input on those upcoming plans. And now for tonight's main speaker. Patrick Siegman is the founder of Siegman and Associates, a transportation planning firm devoted to the creation of sustainable communities. His projects have been honored with awards from the American Institute of Architects, the American Planning Association, the Congress for the New Urbanism, and the Society for College and University Planning. Many of his projects, such as his plans for Oakland, Berkeley, and Ventura, have led to the implementation of innovative parking and traffic reduction reforms. Patrick also served as an advisor to San Francisco's groundbreaking SF Park program, known as perhaps the nation's most far-reaching implementation of advanced parking technologies and pricing policies. Patrick. Ah, Doug, thank you for that kind introduction. And I'd, I'd also like to thank the city of Sunnyvale for inviting me to speak to you all tonight. Um, it's, a, it's a pleasure to be here, um, albeit virtually. Um, and um, to begin, let me tell you a, a little bit about myself and, and about my family. So. This this uh, picture on the screen is actually a picture of downtown Palo Alto, and it's where I was born and raised. Um, my mom and dad, they bought their first house in Palo Alto for about $16,000. And at the time, it cost about 25 cents an hour to park downtown on University Avenue. Well, if you fast forward to today, that same house would cost me about $2 million, and it's free to park downtown. So basically, in the space of a generation, we've completely solved our affordable housing problem for our cars. So today, Americans park for free on 99% of all trips, which is a, a pretty remarkable accomplishment in some ways. Um, but what I want to encourage you to think about tonight is whether free housing for cars and expensive housing for people is really the right set of priorities for the future of Sunnyvale. We know that um, if 
all of Sunnyvale's current policies continue the way they are, then you're likely to get more of the same. Um, but based on the experience of many other cities, we know that if Sunnyvale decided to focus instead less on making sure that everybody has ample free parking and more on what we can do to actually make housing affordable, increase prosperity, improve social equity, reduce traffic, that all of those things can be accomplished. And, and so what I want to share with you tonight is just a few of the parking strategies that have been used by other cities to make progress on achieving those goals. So about, about 15 years ago now, gosh, time flies. Um, I was hired to lead a study for the city of Pasadena called the Pasadena Traffic Reduction Strategy Study. And the study, we sought to um, answer the city's question, which was how can Pasadena reduce motor vehicle trips on its streets by 25% while still uh, maintaining its quality of life and, and um, increasing prosperity? So what we what we did is we set out and we looked at a whole series of, of places and we identified 10 case studies where cities had succeeded in in achieving the goals of reducing a lot of traffic um, and still doing well economically. Um, and what we found was that in all 10 of these places, parking reforms were were absolutely key. And they were places that ranged from suburbs like Arlington County, Virginia, outside of uh, Washington, D.C to Bellevue, Washington, to Boulder, Colorado, um, all the way up to very large cities like London and Stockholm and um, places like San Francisco and Vancouver. So before we talk about some of those strategies, I, I think it could be useful to, to go back and think about how we wound up where we are, um, how, we, how we got here. Um, so when I was when I was a kid, my dad had a, a book on our on our family bookshelf called Two Years Before the Mast. And it was written by a, a man named Richard Henry Dana. And he was a Harvard student when he decided to drop out and, and go see the world. And what he did was he took a job as a sailor on a on a trading ship. They grounded the horn, they came to California before the gold rush, they dropped anchor in Southern California. And he declared that the cove on the coast and the land around it were the most beautiful and romantic spot on the coast he'd seen. Um, well, this is this is what that place looks like today. This is Dana Point, California, um, and it, it's a it it actually I tend to think this photo is so ugly that you know you think that the planning commission might have gotten a bribe to approve this, but in fact, all of the parking spaces you see in this photo are required by law. So. Yeah. In Dana Point, uh, they have minimum parking requirements, just like Sunnyvale and Palo Alto and most other American cities. And minimum parking requirements, to define them, they're government regulations that specify the minimum number of parking spaces you have to build at every land use. So they make sure that you have more parking spaces than people would voluntarily build. And to give you an example, Dana Point requires four parking spaces per thousand square feet of built space for what they call multi-tenant general retail, which basically is strip malls like this one. And what that works out to is about 1.3 square feet of asphalt for every one square foot of actual building space. So if you put a one-story building on 40% of the lot, then the rest of the lot has to be parking. And this has had pretty transformative effects on the shape of our cities. Um, this is a, a building in Old Palo Alto built in the 1920s, designed by a, a Stanford professor named Pedro de Lemos. And one of my one of my favorite spots. Well, after we adopted parking requirements in 1951, we started getting buildings that look like the one on the right, which is also in downtown Palo Alto, a block away. Instead of a three-story building, we got a one-story building and instead of a charming courtyard, we got a large parking lot. So what was the purpose of these regulations? Um, well, sometimes a zoning ordinance will say that it's to provide adequate parking, but that only raises the question, well, adequate for what? So if we read the zoning codes, and I encourage you to read yours, um, 
In Palo Alto, the stated purpose is to alleviate traffic congestion. In Milpitas, it's to relieve congestion on streets. In Napa, it's to reduce street congestion. Um, you could start to see the theme, although some places had higher aspirations. So San Diego said they wanted to um, reduce traffic congestion and improve air quality. Well, it's been more than half a century since most of these cities adopted minimum parking regulations. Uh, traffic congestion is worse than ever. So I, I would submit to you that in fact, these, these requirements aren't working for that purpose. But the one really useful thing that they do do is they prevent spillover parking problems. So for example, at this shopping center in Dana Point, there's so much parking in front of the store off street that it's unlikely that anyone will park on the street and fill up the curb parking spaces there. And it's very unlikely that anybody would ever um, fill up both the lot and the street parking and then wind up having more people come and park around the corner onto a residential street so that when the residents come home, they can't find a place to park on the street. Um, but what was the theory that led people to think that these requirements would be good for reducing traffic congestion? Well, it turns out that the traffic engineers and planners who promoted these back in the 50s really had an economically illiterate theory that where, where they hadn't thought through the, the consequences fully. The theory went something like this. Um, first, that you should set minimum parking regulations to ensure that basically all destinations have ample and often excess spaces, even when you give away parking for free, and even if you have no transit and it's an isolated place. So this happens to be Las Vegas, which was built under those regulations. Um, and you can see it's midweek on a, on a Thursday afternoon. I think this photo was taken. Uh, and there's certainly ample parking. Then the recommendation was to prohibit or discourage charging for parking. Um, and certainly it discourages charging for parking when you have to um, provide so much at every destination that everyone has access. Because why would anyone charge for it if it's, there's excess even when it's free? And then third, traffic engineers would prohibit curb parking. And that of course was easy to do because now there was ample off street parking at every destination. So nobody raised a fuss if you took away the curb parking. And then fourth, that made it possible to convert the curb parking into still more traffic lanes. So now you go to a place like this and, and you find that you've got 18 wheelers and buses uh, brushing by your elbow as you walk down the sidewalk. So they did achieve a couple of things. Um, first of all, you, you no longer have anybody circling around the block in, in search of curb parking. There's more automobile capacity because there's a couple more lanes. But there are also a lot of unintended consequences. Um, I don't know if you can see, but there, there is actually a pedestrian in this photo. Um, but what you, what you tend to create is a landscape like this where nobody crosses the street on foot to shop, because if you do, you'll die. Um, the pedestrian actually is right there with the cars moving all around her. Um, the, my friend Dan Burden, who took this picture, told me that he has several minutes of video of that lady waiting there, hoping that somebody will stop and let her let her finish the crossing. But to really understand the unintended consequences, um, it's important to look at how minimum parking requirements actually get set. So let's take office parks as an example. Um, as you can see in this photo, this is an office park because it has offices and, and parking. Um, I, actually, they, they did hire a landscape architect. You, you, you can tell because there's the wiggly sidewalk. Um, but anyway, they measured parking occupancy at a couple of dozen office parks and they um, published this, the results in a book called the Parking Generation Report. And they covered many land uses in there. Uh, what they found was that at the busiest hour of the busiest day of the week, the average office park had two and a half parking spaces occupied for every 1,000 square feet of built space. And then the highest they found was 4.25 spaces occupied. Well, so where did the minimum get set by most cities? Turns out that 
most cities set their minimum for offices at four parking spaces per thousand square feet of built space. Um, and the good news about that, of course, is that very few places now need to use any street parking and the uh, chances that anybody will call you up as if you're a bureaucrat and complain about a spillover parking is close to zero. Um, but the problem is that that means that at the average office park, even if parking is free, um, you'll have 35% of the parking spaces that just never get used, so that, that even at the busiest hour never get used. So you've wound up building a lot more than the average place needs. And you tend to get a landscape that looks like this. So this, this happens to be Milpitas uh, with San Jose in the background, but it could be a lot of places in America. Um, and you, you get a, this landscape of each individual building sitting in a sea of parking. And so you, you do have lots of uses there. You've got the research and development space. This is Cisco. You have retail shops and restaurants. You have a hotel. Um, but in this, in this kind of uh, you know, built environment, people generally don't want to walk or rarely want to walk from, from one land use to, to another. Um, and as you can see, this again is, is 2.30 in, in the afternoon on, on a Thursday. Um, there's a lot of excess parking. Now, there actually is a light rail station, VTA light rail, just beyond the left edge of this photo up here. Um, but in order to use it, you're, you face a long walk from that station along the side of a pretty high speed road surrounded by parking lots. And eventually you'll, you'll make it to your office or trudge over to the hotel or the shops. But one of the results of this kind of landscape is that it undermines transit performance to the extent that this system is one of the worst performing light rail systems in, in North America. And rather than having alleviated congestion, the nearby freeways 880 and 237 are among the most congested in the country. So another thing to think about is what does all this parking cost? Well, when you run out of land to build cheap surface lots or when land becomes valuable and you want it for some of the use, you start building parking structures, which of course is often done in Silicon Valley because land is valuable. Um, and what does it cost? Well, it turns out a pretty typical cost these days is about $50,000 per space gained. Now that's the cost to build it. Um, actually, I'm starting to see parking structures come in at much higher cost. Palo Alto has one that was recently proposed where the cost estimates came in at $122,000 per space gained. So the, the um, cost really adds up. And you know, one thing to look at is um, once you've spent all that money, do the spaces actually get used? And here it's pretty clear that on this particular garage, uh, they're, they're not getting used. This is Redwood City. And one of the reasons you could tell that is this garage is several years old, but there are no oil stains on these spaces. Well, so how much revenue do you need to break even on this kind of garage? Well, on a $50,000 parking space using pretty typical assumptions, so a 35 year useful lifespan for the garage, a 5% interest rate, operating and maintaining the elevators and the lights and so on. It comes out to about $335 a month in revenue that you would need just to break even. And so the corollary is that anything that your community can do to reduce parking demand for less than $335 per month per space is actually a bargain. So if you can get somebody to walk or, or bike or carpool or, or ride the bus, you save this money and of course you save some traffic as well. So to sum it up, if you think about the unintended consequences of these regulations, what we wound up is we have excess spaces, even at suburban locations where parking's free. The cost of course doesn't go away, it just gets hidden in the cost of other goods and services. Because parking now seems to be free to you when you're a motorist, 
we get more people driving to more destinations, higher parking demand, more congestion, more pollution, and 101 starts to look like the traffic jam on the right. And then we all have to pay more for more parking and, and bigger roads. And where do those costs show up? Well, it doesn't happen in our role as motorists. It happens in all our other roles in life. So it's higher rents at our home or more cost for groceries and, and movie tickets or higher taxes or all of the above. And if you think about uh, how this has played out for housing, well, back in 1961, Oakland, they instituted their very first parking requirement, which was requiring one space per home for apartments. And a couple of real estate economists studied this and they found that construction costs went up by 15% per apartment, excuse me, 18% per apartment. The number of apartments per acre fell by nearly a third and land value fell by 33%. So now picture that you had been the economic development director for Oakland back in 1961. And imagine that you had gone to the city council and said, okay, so I have this great new regulation and what it's going to do is increase housing costs and reduce housing supply and cut land values by a third. Well, I think that if city council members had actually known those would be the consequences, this never would have been adopted, but it was. And now today in Sunnyvale, um, for single family houses and duplexes, uh, the code requires a minimum of four off street parking spaces. So if requiring just one parking space per unit has these effects, well, what do you think that would do um, uh, when you require four times as many? So among the um, unintended consequences, it turns out that the cost of, of um, building that additional parking does get passed along to the, to the tenants. And we've seen this in multiple studies. So, uh, Recent study by the Sightline Institute of a recently built apartment complexes in Seattle found these results. Um, we have a, a um, nearly $250 per month increase in rents for the average apartment, which is especially a problem because nearly 20% of the occupants have no car. And what that means is that a lot of people who either can't afford a car or choose not to own one are having to pay for parking that they don't want and they and they can't use. And there's also a lot of unused parking. And always with policies, it's important to think about the effect on, on social equity. Well, if we ask whether we should subsidize housing for cars or for people and think about the equity impacts, um, well, of course, housing is a basic human need. If you subsidize housing for people, Everybody can make use of that. But parking subsidies, they only work um, if you are able to come up with the money required to purchase and operate and maintain and insure a car. Um, if you look at ownership by, by income level, among people who make $10,000 or a year or less, only about half own motor vehicles. Among households that make 70,000 a year or more, 97% do, and, and actually many have two or three cars. So what ends up happening is that the, the wealthiest among us own more vehicles per household, drive more often, park more, and therefore benefit a lot more from uh, parking subsidies. So if we want to help out people who are in need, parking subsidies turn out to be a remarkably inefficient way to do it. So those are the problems. What are, what are some of the reforms? Um, UCLA professor Donald Shoup, who's been a mentor to me for a long time, he recommends three parking policy reforms. The first is to charge the right prices for curb parking. Second is to return all the parking revenue to the blocks where it's generated to pay for public services. And, and that makes it politically popular, or at least it helps to. And then once you do that, once you manage the curb parking so there won't be shortages, then you can remove all of the minimum parking regulations and let parking become more of an ordinary good that is rented and leased, bought and sold, just like other things in our society. And 
these reforms, after having worked to implement them with communities for more than 20 years, um, it, it's become clear that these reforms can be used really just about anywhere from destinations out in the countryside to suburban locations, right down to the downtowns of our biggest cities. Let me share with you a, a couple of examples of doing that here in California. Uh, back in 2005, I was, I was hired by Ventura to lead their downtown parking study. And everybody was convinced they had a parking shortage in downtown Ventura. All of the parking spaces here on Main Street tended to fill up and, and stay pretty full all day long. The situation was the same on the side streets. But then when we went and counted cars in the nearby lots and garages, just half a block away, we found they tended to look like this. And so we came to that conclusion that building more parking spaces, as many people were proposing to do, could not possibly solve their perceived parking shortage. So what we did is we charged the right prices per curb parking, meaning the price that would be just high enough to make sure that you had at least one or two available spaces on every block and yet low enough so that parking spaces were well used and you weren't driving customers away. So it's, it's kind of the Goldilocks price, not too high, not too low. And at the time, all of the parking in downtown Ventura was free. So we put meters on just um, 318 out of 2,500 spaces. So just on the, the main street and on the retail side streets. And actually we took away all of the time limits because the one of the great things about setting the right price is that as long as you have one or two available spaces on every block most of the time, so that there's a space when you show up and want to park on that block, you really don't care how long anybody else on that block has been parked there. So the way it works at, in practice is that you, your, your city should set a target range. What we did in Ventura is we set a target range of each block being at least 65% full, um, but not more than 85% full most of the time. And every month in the beginning, the city would check occupancy rates on each block. If a block was above 85% occupied, meaning it was too full, then they would raise the rates on that block by 25 cents an hour. If they were within the target range, the price stayed the same. And if a block was below 65% occupied, then they lowered the rate. Um, and we, we followed this same principle actually for um, hours of operation. And then all of the revenue we agreed to dedicate by city ordinance back to downtown. So all the meter revenues were gonna fund public services for that district. Um, now it turned out that the city staff initially wanted to, to um, fund a new shuttle for downtown and, and to serve nearby destinations. Uh, but when we talked to the merchants, they were really much more interested in solving the problem that downtown was perceived by many people as, as being unsafe. And so people didn't want to shop there. Well, we realized that unless we spent the money on things that were actually popular with the downtown merchants and property owners, that it was very likely there wouldn't be any revenue because they wouldn't support it and the city council wouldn't, wouldn't support it. So what we agreed to do is to spend all of the new money on a new police officer to patrol downtown, dedicated full -time, time, and then nine police cadets. Um, they, the city also put in better lighting in a lot of the parking lots. Um, and actually, because the meters were wirelessly networked, we were able to use the same Wi-Fi um, system to provide free public Wi-Fi downtown. So what did we achieve? Well, the, the rates wound up being between 50 cents and a dollar an hour, depending on the block. The um, hours of operation, 10 to nine. They wound up pulling in more than half a million dollars a year annually from just 318 meters. So well over $1,000 per parking space per year. Um, and what happened is in the first six months, crime went down by 40% in downtown and a bunch of new businesses opened up. The other thing that happened is um, the, the mayor wrote this blog on the, on the very first day of operation. And he, he said, you know, oh, 
about 10 30 this morning i stepped out of my office and i noticed something different the paid parking program of our downtown parking management program went into effect at 10 and it was already showing results so basically what he saw was that a lot of the employees who had been parked all day downtown instead of parking on main street and moving their car every couple of hours like they used to they had actually moved their cars into the lots and the upper level of the garage and there were now plenty of spaces available on the street and so a parking a perceived parking shortage that had persisted for decades was gone 30 minutes after we turned the meters on there are lots of cities now that have instituted similar systems so I worked with Berkeley to, to implement this in 2010. Berkeley set the same occupancy targets um, for um, curb parking availability and the same the, the, the same policy. But because Berkeley is um, denser and and has a lot more going on than Ventura, the rates needed to do that wound up being between $1.75 and 375 per hour on each block. At least that's what it was last time I checked. The revenue again was returned back to downtown to pay for public services and in in this case there was a lot of concern about making sure that downtown felt clean and safe and a uh, desire to provide more services for the homeless and also to help fund parking and so um, some of the meter revenue that was additional was used to to do that now one thing that's important to know is that um, it's become a lot easier and cheaper with modern technologies to do this kind of parking management. So Berkeley uses license plate recognition. And one of the things that allows is that you can enforce more easily. Um, and it also means that in their residential parking permit areas, they no longer need to have people um, come down to the office and turn in an application and get a piece of plastic to stick on their bumper. Uh, instead, your license plate serves as your virtual parking permit. So for example, if you get a new car, you can just go online and log in to, to your account and change your, um, your license plate number online um, instead of having to make a trip down to downtown. The um, other thing is that you're able to use the license plate recognition systems to, to count cars, and this can be done actually as routine enforcement is happening. So you generate the occupancy data instead of having to do so many surveys the way we used to, uh, that is manual surveys. So what happened? Well, Berkeley as well, they, they found that they were able to move a lot of drivers um, from overfilling the curbs into the formerly underused garages. And actually they didn't have to move that many drivers um, because the parking supply at the curb is such a small fraction of the total but one of the things that i thought was most remarkable is that there was so much less circling in search of underpriced curb parking what happened was a, a couple of uc berkeley um, professors studied the results of, of this experiment and what they uh, estimated is 693,000 fewer vehicle miles of travel per year mostly due to simply fewer people driving around in circles after they'd arrived in search of parking. So they, they basically, Berkeley got rid of a lot of people who had already arrived, but weren't going anywhere. I mean, who were, had already arrived and were driving, but weren't going anywhere. In San Francisco, um, initially when San Francisco implemented its performance-based parking pricing, that is setting rates according to demand, um, they set up pilot zones and control zones to test this out and again had um, a good grant from the federal government to, to study the results and had had uh, UC Berkeley and Santa Cruz researchers study it. One of the things they found was that after implementing the new system in 2007, there were far more sales in the areas where they had implemented the performance-based parking pricing than in the control zones where the old system was kept in place. So it was a 35% increase in the areas of where the new system was in place versus only about 20 in the pilot area in the control areas so those are three examples of of using this kind of approach in a um in a, a commercial area but 
of course, it's really important to manage curb parking in residential areas, and especially if you want to allow more housing in those areas. So a lot of cities have been starting to allow uh, what my friend Dan Perola calls missing middle housing. And missing middle housing is things like this fourplex in, in Pasadena. Um, it takes the form of a large single family house, so it fits in well in a, in a neighborhood. Um, and yet it's actually got four apartments in it. Um, but imagine that you proposed allowing this without requiring the um, uh, developer to actually build any off street parking. People would be afraid that this, the people who live here are gonna park all their cars on the street and, and fill up the whole block. So if you wanna allow this kind of missing middle housing, it's really important to learn to manage curb parking well. So um, if you decide you wanna allow the various types of, of missing middle housing, ranging from duplexes on up to courtyard apartments and bungalow courts and townhouses and so on, um, it's important to manage the parking and do it properly. Um, it, one thing you don't wanna do is what uh, Boston did. Boston decided that they would just give out unlimited permits for all of their residential parking permit areas. Uh, and um, they, they gave out nearly 4,000 permits for Beacon Hill neighborhood. And years later, somebody went back and counted and discovered that they only had approximately 900 curb parking spaces in Beacon Hill. So basically they, they created hunting licenses and failed to solve the, the problem of overcrowded street parking. So what can be done instead is to do what Tucson does, which is they will issue no more than one curb parking permit for every legal curb parking space. Um, there are many ways to do this, but Tucson's approach is if you build, let's say a fourplex, um, but there are only three legal parking spaces on the frontage in, in front of that property, then the, the owner of that property is only allowed to have three um, spaces to park on the street in, in that neighborhood. So that way there's never more than one permit issued for every curb space. And what that does is it means that when somebody's building a, a new development, they know that they can't just dump a whole bunch of cars into the neighborhood. And actually, if you have um, people who are thinking of crowding a whole bunch of roommates into, into a um, house and dumping a lot of cars on the street, they know that they can't do that as well. And so that way, there's a very strong incentive for all of these developers and other folks to provide enough off-street parking to actually make sure they meet their needs. Another really good tool is the Residential Parking Benefit District, which is really a residential version of um, the kind of, of district that Ventura and, and Berkeley put in place in their downtowns. And what you can do, again, in order to make this politically acceptable, it's often a really good idea to charge non-residents and future residents for curb parking and return the revenue to the neighborhood. But then let the existing residents park for free or park cheaply. So that way, what you're doing is, um, the person who's lived in, in their house for 35 years and parked for free on the street all that time, um, they're, they're not um, suddenly facing a, a, a big bill for something they've taken for granted for so long and, and started to assume is, is their right. Um, but on the other hand, you are able to generate some money and prevent spillover that's excessive from non-residents or, or future people. And the thing about charging non-residents, it's kind of like Mark Twain's advice that we should um, charge taxes to foreigners living in other countries. Uh, basically, non-residents, they, they don't have much political clout in a town usually because they don't live there and therefore they can't vote in your council election. Uh, similarly, future residents can't vote um, because they aren't there at the time that, that you decide to institute the new system. So basically, um, when you do this, you're able to ease in to, to parking uh, pricing for a, a residential neighborhood. Um, and over time, as existing residents move away uh, and turn in their permits, eventually you can reach the point where you're, you're charging market rates for parking and have succeeded in, in eliminating any existing shortages that might exist. And then once you do that, you can remove the minimum parking regulations. So 
one good example of doing this is Laguna Beach. Uh, there, of course, they have a ton of tourists coming in, flocking to their beaches and so on. The non-resident tourists, they pay a dollar to three dollars an hour to park in their downtown and streets near the beach. Residents pay only 40 a year for their permits. So what this does is for a lot of these um, beach towns like Laguna Beach that have this system, uh, what it does is that they're able to raise a, a lot of money, which helps um, pay for things like all of the lifeguards and other services needed to to handle all these visitors. Um, and yet the the residents only gain the the benefits of the tourists and and don't have to pay for a lot all that. So now once you've managed all of the curb parking properly, you can actually follow the lead of a lot of cities that have removed minimum parking regulations. So this is a long list of places, um, far from exhaustive though, that have removed minimum parking requirements in either some or all districts. And you see places like Buffalo and Hartford and um, Minneapolis that have removed all of their minimum parking requirements citywide. Um, closer to home, we no longer have them in San Francisco. Um, Emeryville just got rid of all of theirs last month. Um, the, um, the, the more sort of uh, uh, tentative approach or step-by-step -step approach is just to do it in certain districts. So for example, what Mountain View did is in the North Bayshore area where they really wanted to limit new traffic, they got rid of all the minimum parking requirements and imposed maximums instead, along with a lot of other traffic reduction requirements. So those are the those are the fundamentals, but there are also some really good steps that uh, cities have taken to regulate private development in ways that reduce traffic. In the downtown Berkeley plan, um, Berkeley required the unbundling of parking costs from rents, by which I mean your landlords are required to charge separately uh, for parking versus the rent for an actual apartment. And what that does is it allows people to save money by owning fewer cars. And then they also require the provision of spaces for car share cars if a development decides to include parking. And then at least one free transit pass is required to be issued for every um, new, new apartment uh, in perpetuity. So that gets paid for basically through the um, rents, or in the case of condominiums, the common area maintenance fees. And it turns out that it's been a pretty effective tool for really reducing traffic and reducing pollution from the, all the new buildings going up in downtown. So the, the Gaia building, uh, you're, you're seeing the roof dev deck of it here in this picture on the left. Um, it has 91 apartments, a theater, a cafe on the ground floor, penthouse office space for uh, the company that built it. Um, last time I checked, they were charging $150 per month per space. They had a couple of car share cars in, in the garage. They, they only built 42 parking spaces. Well, what they got is 237 adult residents with just 20 cars. Now, in um, Sunnyvale, because Sunnyvale is more auto dependent, doesn't have the level of transit service and, and mix of uses that downtown Berkeley does, it's not likely that you would get um, such low automobile use in, in your downtown or in, or in say, Moffat Park. But, but what I really wanna uh, focus your attention on is the principles. These same principles work anywhere. Another key step is to require the unbundling of parking costs from commercial leases. So um, back in the 90s, downtown Bellevue, Washington, they really wanted to allow a lot of economic development and start allowing um, these office towers that, that you see uh, in their town. Um, and they'd been a pretty sleepy bedroom suburb. So they said, okay, we, we really wanna minimize the traffic that comes out of these. And so they, set a minimum price that had to be charged for monthly parking of at least twice, uh, excuse me, at least the price of a two zone bus pass. So that means that in 2017, the minimum rate for, for monthly parking was $135 a month in their downtown. And then they also set maximum parking requirements um, as a sort of additional way of making sure that there wasn't um, room for too many cars 
to be added to their downtown and, and to the streets leading to downtown. And what they got is the drive alone commute rate in their downtown fell by nearly a third. So from 81% driving alone to 57%. And if you think about it, oftentimes it only takes about a 10% ch change in the amount of traffic at an intersection or on a freeway to go from free flow and pretty uncongested to really congested. So these kinds of measures really matter. Let's see, one last one I'll mention is uh, requiring parking cash out. So Santa Monica has a, has a good city ordinance that does this. And what it says is if an employer in a new development chooses to subsidize employee parking, then they have to give all the employees who don't drive the cash value of that parking subsidy. So if it's worth $10 a day, um, then if you don't drive, you get $10 a day to help you with your bike commute or walking or um, carpooling or, or riding a bus. And there, there's a few options for doing this. And in the interest of time, I'll skip over them. But, it's, but one simple option is just to use a local ordinance to enforce California's existing state parking cash out law. Um, now, parking cash out is really effective. And importantly, it's also much more popular with employees than actually charging for parking. Because what it does is it improves the transportation choices for employees, but it doesn't cost them anything more. And, and actually, they can still have free parking if they want it. So this is from a, a series of, of case studies of parking in um, Southern California employers, all suburban locations. And what they found was that when $165 a month parking cash out was offered, that um, parking demand and traffic fell by about 30%. So it's pretty substantial. And we've had really good luck implementing that with, with uh, places like Genentech here in the Bay Area. So uh, last topic I, I want to cover before we go to questions is, um, you know, I, I sort of wanted to be not just a transportation planner, but a futurist. So let's talk a little bit about new technologies. Of course, Uber and Lyft and other ride hailing services have really emerged in the last few years. Um, in San Francisco in 2016, it had reached the point where Uber and Lyft and other ride hailing trips made up 15% of all the vehicle trips that both started and ended in San Francisco, which unfortunately created a lot more traffic congestion, especially in downtown where the trips are, tend to be concentrated. But one of the benefits it had, well, at least a benefit um, from the point of view of making it easy to find a parking space, is that parking demand in San Francisco has been dropping at a rate of more than 1% per year every year for the last five years or so. And the cause is primarily from ride hailing. So we, we know this in part because um, of San Francisco's parking tax revenues, which are charged to all public and private lots and garages. Um, and as you can see, it's been dropping steadily. Now, the same thing is occurring nationwide, and it's especially occurring any place where people can save money by using less parking. Um, it's, it's also occurring where people like to go out and, and go drinking and, and uh, have a good time at night. Um, so Ace Parking says that at uh, their operations, they have hundreds of parking operations across the country. They've been seeing a 5 to 10% drop at, at a lot of hotels, at restaurant valet, down 25%, nightclub valets down 50%. Um, and then to ride hailing, you have to add the, the arrival of self-driving shuttles and taxis. And of course, this is in early stages, but they are now picking up passengers and operating on public streets in quite a few locations. Uh, this, this happens to be the old town of Sion, Switzerland. And um, for about four years now, they've been running these Navia self-driving shuttles. They, they started out just in the um, pedestrian precinct where they were mixing with bicycles and pedestrians. Then as they um, really made, made sure they had confidence in the technology, they began using it out on city streets to run about a mile to the nearest train station. 
So it covers that shuttle. Um, Navia and its competitors have also been starting to serve a lot of other cities. So this is uh, Fremont Street in Las Vegas, where they've had one running for a few years. And then meanwhile, Waymo and basically every other large automaker and a couple of, of uh, uh, tech companies and quite a few startups have been working on self-driving taxis and shuttles. So Waymo kind of had their kitty talk moment in 2019. Um, that they, they first began testing their self-driving cars on public streets with no, nobody in the driver's seat three years ago. And then last year, they actually began providing self-driving taxi service to the general public with no backup driver in the Phoenix area. Of course, this service isn't here in the Bay Area yet, but you may have noticed that Waymo vehicles and a lot of other um, self-driving car companies are testing on our streets. Um, and Waymo has received permission uh, to begin operating self-driving taxis in Mountain View and Sunnyvale and a few other uh, Silicon Valley cities. It's, it's just limited to employees right now, but they plan to expand. So what does this all mean for the, the future of, of parking, parking demand and parking policy? Well, both of these technologies are cutting into parking demand. And with both transit and taxis, typically about 80% of the cost, 75 to 80% of the cost is really the driver. When you are able to replace the driver with much less expensive technology, it means that the cost of providing transit and taxi service plummets. And by contrast, I haven't seen any technology on the horizon that will reduce in any substantial way the amount of land that's needed for surface parking lots or that will reduce the high cost of all that concrete and steel needed to build uh, parking garages. So a lot of researchers have looked at this and everybody's speculating. Nobody knows exactly when this technology will really be widespread. Nobody knows exactly what form it will come in, but it's coming pretty fast. And the estimates range from a drop of between 50% and 90%, according to most researchers, in uh, parking demand. So you really have to think twice before you build a very expensive capital asset like a parking garage, which in, who knows, 10, 20, 30 years may not be needed. And actually, if you're only building that garage to comply with minimum parking regulations rather than with real market demand, well, there's a good chance that garage is being built um, to simply provide excess spaces and was never really needed in the first place if you had actually managed the curb parking. So what can we do today? Um, well, there's a lot we could do today to both make things better right now and to prepare for a future where parking demand falls. Um, and this, this tri slide tries to sum up the basics. Basically on the commercial blocks, do what Berkeley and, and Ventura and San Francisco and others have done and charge the right prices for curb parking. Bring, bring the revenue back to the blocks where it's generated to pay for whatever the public services people who live there or work there most want. And then remove all your minimum parking regulations. In the residential blocks, you follow basically the same guide, but it's often a really good idea to make sure that the existing residents can have free or cheap permits. And then in the beginning, you're only charging uh, non-residents and potentially future residents. Um, and then eventually over time, you wanna get to the point where you're only issuing um, no more than one residential parking permit for every curb parking space so things aren't overcrowded. Well, that's about all I know, and I think I'm about out of time. So at this point, I'm happy to take your questions and, and look forward to as lively a discussion as we have on, on this virtual technology. So thanks much for your time. Yeah, thanks, Patrick, for that illuminating presentation. I know I, for one, definitely learned a lot, and I hope that everyone else here did too. So like Patrick said, we have around 30 minutes for a Q&A session. Um, just as a reminder to ask a question, you'll just want to click 
the icon that looks like a little speech bubble with a question mark in it, and then you can submit your question. Um, we already have some great questions there, so I'll begin. So Patrick, David Cole asks, how will parking change during and post COVID where office buildings will not be 100% occupied? And in the downtown areas, restaurants will probably want to use more street space for social distancing. He also mentions that the possibility of closing um, Murphy Street, Cal Ave, and in um, Sunnyvale and University in Palo Alto. Yeah, so it, it's a really good question. The how will parking change with with COVID-19? You know, we're all trying to figure that out and none of us really know. And it depends so much on a, a couple of things. Um, first of all, um, it depends on on the the level of leadership we have and and um, effectiveness and in, in actually getting the virus under control. I, I, some of you may have seen the news that New Zealand just reported that they haven't had a single new case in five days and they no longer have anyone hospitalized. And it's because they did a really good job testing and tracing uh, people who were in, uh, testing and contact tracing um, to get the the um, epidemic under control. Um, and in the long run, of course, Dr. Dr. Fauci is cautiously optimistic that there will be a vaccine. So I tend to be cautiously optimistic as well that within a few years we will actually have a, an effective vaccine. Um, so I, I, I am hoping that between testing and contact tracing and a vaccine that that eventually things will go back to to something like normal. Um, but in the meantime, yeah, it's clear that we're just going to wind up with an awful lot of excess parking beyond the excess that most destinations already have. Um, so it's it actually makes it quite an easy time to to relax or eliminate minimum parking requirements. And then um, with the the restaurants, there are a number of restaurants that have already done um, or, I'm sorry, a number of cities that have already done a good job of of allowing restaurants to use more street space. And I think it, it's um, an approach that really makes sense. Uh, one one thing to look at is that there are a lot of places where um, it turns out that completely closing streets, at least too many blocks, um, you can wind up with a situation where you you actually um, have a street that feels kind of dead and lifeless. Um, so you want to close enough of a street to cars so that you have plenty of room for outdoor tables and and social distancing and yet not so much um, that you just wind up with a lot of empty asphalt and and dead space and that's really an urban design question from street to street um, the the um the the one one last thing i'll say is that places like uh castro street and mountain view um, one of the great things there is that Castro Street was designed right from the beginning um, to allow every single um, building owner to be able to take the parking in front of his um, shop or restaurant and change it into uh, outdoor dining if he wanted to. Um, and so they're they're actually already set to let every um, downtown restaurant take over the tables if they haven't done it already. Yeah, that sounds great. We got another great question from David Cole, and he said, I've seen many of these presentations over the years, and many have been sponsored by many cities, and we still don't see parking reforms. Why do you think that is? Cities don't uh, want to charge for parking? It, it Well, I think there's tremendous inertia, in, and there's tremendous inertia in local democracy, and the 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 reality oftentimes is that it it often takes some kind of crisis to change things or or it takes some retirements um, on on city staff or on city councils um, and the the other thing is that um, in the past there just wasn't as much knowledge and the technology wasn't as good so when I first started working on managing curb parking we didn't have license plate recognition. We heck when I, I remember, I think 
when we created a web page for the Stanford Transportation Department when I worked there, it was the second department in the in the world to have a, a departmental website for for transportation. <laughs> so um, now that now that all that's really changed, I think what one of the things that's begun to happen is that um, there's far more published research and far more knowledge about how to do this. Um, and so that's really changing things, but it does take um, focused advocacy oftentimes by citizens. One one thing that um, I recommend is there's a group called the Parking Reform Network, which was founded by a Portland resident who he set up a group to advocate for parking reform in his city. They were really successful. And so he founded this as a nationwide network, the Parking Reform Network, in order to help citizens around the country set up their own advocacy groups to to um, call for some of these reforms and advocate for them. Great answer. We have a question from Mark and he mentions that our downtown specific plan considers a certain area, but people are willing to park for free on residential streets just outside of the downtown specific plan area. How do you prevent this? Yeah. Yeah, uh, it was a classic problem. So one one thing is that when when I work on downtown plans or similar area plans, um, what I what I always try to do is make sure that the plan includes when it comes to parking recommendations for managing the curb parking within a five minute walk at least of the edge of the official study area. So um, what usually what we what we will do is include in the plan a set of recommendations for managing all that that curb parking and you know it, you can either see that um, demand from people to park on neighborhood streets as a just a problem or an opportunity so for example what what boulder does is they allow a limited number of commuters to park on residential streets during the day in the residential permit zones that they've set up surrounding their downtown I think they issue four permits to commuters for each block and then the, those permits are cheaper than um, a monthly permit for a garage within the downtown but they still raise a, a fair amount of money and then what you can do is you can take that money that you've raised and use it to to help improve the neighborhood um, now of course the other option is to do simply a residential parking permit zone that that just doesn't allow any commuter parking um and and uh, that option is available too so the um another another thing to to think about is that now lots of cities use um pay by phone which means that you don't need to have any physical meters in an area or perhaps you have just one physical meter for an entire neighborhood but that way people can pull into a, a neighborhood um and if you do make it pay parking then you can simply have signs that say residential permit or call this number to to pay for your parking all right we have another question from tim oye and he asks so charging for parking reduces traffic but ride sharing is increasing traffic so how do we really get to a lot less traffic yeah so with ride hailing um it, it's a it's a challenge that of course can't be uh, effectively handled by parking pricing because people who commute by by ride hailing like lyft and uber they don't park right they get they get dropped off um and i think that there are two ways to effectively limit the the congestion that's being created by um, a lot of ride hailing uh, trips to certain places um one way is to charge uh, congestion pricing fees for driving on roads. So for example, the, the you've got the express lanes where um, you have to pay a fee to drive on, on um, the um, express lanes on, for example, Highway 237 and parts of 580 and 680. And that's that's one way. Um, and there what they do is the, the fee is um, the lowest rate needed to keep those lanes moving at the speed limit with um with downtown areas what places like london and stockholm and oslo are, have done 
is there's a fee to enter downtown with a car, except for um, certain limited vehicles like residents who live inside the zone may be may be exempted. Um, but that's a really good way of, of basically reducing the the or eliminating the congestion that cars entering can cause. And then the other way um, is you can charge pickup and drop off fees and you can charge fees that vary according to how congested the location is. Um, so for example, if you if you um, take a ride hail vehicle to SFO, there's a fee to, to pick up and drop off. I think it's now five or seven dollars. Um, and so that's a good way to to reduce a lot of the bride hail traffic. Um, the and and then on everything else, parking pricing remains a really really effective tool for the vast majority of trips that are that are still done by um, or still would be done by single occupant vehicle. And when once you do charge, um, then you basically um, are able to create that situation where, for example, suppose somebody wants to live in downtown Sunnyvale, they want to live a life where they can walk to a lot of destinations. Um, now they can save a lot of money by either having one fewer car in their household or um, no car at all and relying on car sharing and other options for meeting their daily needs. Um, so the, the, you know, the, the, the challenge, of course, is that it's easy for the ride handling companies to to move faster than local governments manage to keep up, and that's what we're seeing. But you can you can look at the leading cities that that have done congestion pricing to see what's possible. That's great. So we have a couple questions about bike scooters and micro mobility. So Eric, Crystal Wickham, and Molly Cox all asked about that. Um, so first, what are your thoughts on bike scooters and micro mobility? Um, how can we get better biking infrastructure? And if we have more street parking, will that interfere with um, bike lanes? Yeah, yeah. So the it, it's a it's a great question, and um, you know one of the really heartening things is that we're seeing a lot of cities move really rapidly to create a lot more space on the street for for walking and bicycling. Um, now that traffic is down, and and now that people need room to to social distance. And I think a lot of those changes will be permanent even after the crisis passes. So, um, well, what I recommend doing in a lot of plans is to first decide um, how much street parking, uh, or rather, how much of streets you you want to be using to provide space for safe bicycling and comfortable bicycling and and walking as well, um, versus how much you want to use for for curb parking. You know, in most um, downtowns, usually it's somewhere between 10% and 30% of the parking supply in a downtown is the curb parking. So it's often a, a fairly small amount. Um, you can often lay out a, a really complete uh, network of protected bicycle lanes, removing some of the curb parking. And then if you use um, the right parking prices to make sure that the remaining curb parking spaces are available, then you can accomplish both goals. What what we've often done in in downtowns and other areas is to to explicitly state uh, the community priorities for use of street space. Um, and oftentimes, for example, um, the modes that are most efficient at moving people in ways that take up not much space get the top priority. So, for example, walking, biking, transit, and then um, storing cars uh, long term is somewhere down near the bottom and short term parking is is uh, in the middle. Great, we have another question from Francisco M and he asks, how do you think autonomous vehicles will change demand for off street versus on street parking in the next 10 to 15 years? Yeah, um, we're 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 going to see First, that there's a lot more pickup and drop off activity. It's it's already happening with Lyft and Uber in in downtowns and and lots of other places. Um, it's already happening with a lot more e-commerce deliveries. So one thing we're going to see is not not so much an increase in in on-street parking demand, 
but more demand for uh, loading space on street. And so it's often important to, to make sure that cities have a policy of switching curb parking to loading wherever loading activity is is um, uh, often happening otherwise you get a lot of double parking and then i think generally um, the effect on most areas is that parking demand will fall and it will fall with um, the first places that empty out are generally the places that are least convenient that is the parking spaces that are least convenient and or the parking spaces that are that are highest priced um, and and by contrast the you know the great premium front door parking spaces right in front of shops and restaurants tend to be the ones that that are are gonna um, are gonna be um, used that will continue to be used and so uh, actually a lot of times what happens is that you can have parking demand falling in a downtown and people tend not to notice because their favorite parking spaces are still full whereas it's that bottom floor of a garage or or of an underground garage or the top floor of an above ground garage that's what's emptied out um, now if you do use good curb parking pricing then you can avoid that problem but since most cities don't do that yet it it tends to be the situation that if you go to say downtown Palo Alto on a Friday night, there's plenty of empty parking spaces, but they're all in sort of the the least convenient and hardest to find parts of downtown. So for this next question, I'm going to pull in Michelle King, who gave the presentation about um, Sunnyvale, and some people are wondering whether Sunnyvale has done anything. Um, similar to what Patrick has described during the presentation. And if not, can Sunnyvale try out some of these ideas in test areas? Thanks. Um, I'm also going to maybe respond to a, a question you had about um, how to help these things happen or why they don't happen, um, parking reform. So uh, in the next um, two weeks or so, the city is going to um, publish online the results of a parking study that was completed for the downtown um, specific plan area by Walker Consultants. And many of the recommendations that Walker Consultants has in their conclusions align with the presentation you saw tonight. So um, some of the things we found in their very extensive 200 page parking analysis is that um, downtown Sunnyvale, and this was all done prior to the COVID-19 um, restrictions, but the downtown Sunnyvale has um, quite a bit of parking and enough parking to support the current development and plan future development, but what it lacks is wayfinding for parking. And there's quite a bit of parking that it goes underutilized, just like there was a discussion earlier about parking on upper floors um, of parking garages uh, being left empty with no oil marks where surface parking lots where people can visually <laughs> see parking being utilized at 85 percent and then people circulate circulating around blocks looking for parking and creating local traffic because they can't find the parking so I think um, there's some exciting things in the parking study and there are long-term um, medium and short-term um, recommendations and um, I hope that people um, gravitate towards that report and read it and participate in the upcoming process because um, the amendment to the downtown specific plan also utilizes the information from that parking study and puts it into um, policies and um, implementation uh, an implementation plan. So the good news is that um, in, a, in, a, in our regular operating world prior to the restrictions we're living under now, downtown Sunnyvale has a great resource of public parking, which is great. Um, and there are, are some um, some paths to make it mo way more efficient and to reduce traffic in the downtown. Um, I would also say um, that the Moffat Park specific plan is going to be an opportunity for people to participate in really thinking um, or being futurists, um, as noted earlier um, by Patrick about and kind of reimagining an area and what the future could provide for shared parking or reduced parking and 
um, a combination of transit. There could be a circulator in Moffat Park that provides rides around Moffat Park where nobody needs to use their automobile. And we're really thinking for Moffat Park big picture about how it could be connected to the rest of the city in non auto automotive waves. Um, so I would encourage people to uh, look for that parking study that's going to be coming out. It'll be available on the city's website and you can find the downtown um, materials under topics under the planning department's website um, web page and it'll be there for people to review. That's pretty exciting. So this was very timely. Um, I, I learned a lot as well listening to the presentation, but there are, um, I would say there's a good chunk of things that were presented tonight that show up in that report. Thanks for that, Michelle. Um, we have another question from Anonymous for Patrick, and they ask, has you ever seen a residential permit price that went up for larger or dirtier vehicles? Seems like a Chevy Suburban should pay more than a smart car. Right. Um, I, I, I've i certainly heard people propose it. I, offhand, I can't think of any places that have done it for, um, for street parking. Um, there, there are there actually is a complexity in in state law um, regarding charging for uh, curb parking and setting up residential parking permit districts. Um, and this doesn't precisely go to your question, but it it um, it's it's important enough for the general topic of of charging for um, curb parking that I want to mention it. And and that is. Um, here in uh, state law in California, we have one law that is about setting up residential parking permit districts. Uh, and what that law says is that you can only charge enough for the permits to cover, um, I forget the exact language, but it's something to the effect of the administrative costs or, or the direct costs of setting up and, and running the, the program. And most, uh, uh, at least some attorneys have interpreted that to mean um, that you that you can't charge um, a whole bunch beyond what it costs you to basically operate and and run the program. So, for example, you can't charge for the land value. And so we have a couple questions about how people are supposed to get to work if the transit system is inadequate. Um, should people use ride hailing and the same for um, elderly residents who might not be able to take public transportation or bike? Right, right. Um, and Oh, actually, one one thing on that that last thing is um, one of the answers to that is if you're setting up a system of charging, use the state law that allows you to set up parking meter zones. You don't actually have to put in physical parking meters. You can make it pay by phone, but the la that allows you to, to charge whatever uh, you want, and it allows you to do things like charge a higher rate for larger or dirtier vehicles. Um, but but I'm sorry, what was the what, what was the last question you, you asked Emma again? Yeah, for sure. So um, we had a couple questions about um, accessibility. So how are people supposed to get to work if there's less parking, but not very um, great public transportation? Or what about yeah. elderly residents who may not feel comfortable on public transportation or may not be able to bike? Right, right. Um, it, it's, a, it's a really important topic. And what I recommend is to think about the options that are available in every place, um, and there are always options, to recognize that they often won't work for er everybody, but they will work for some, and then to set up programs that, that help people and improve their choices. So for example, when we were working for Genentech, um, they were in a, as still are, in a suburban office park in South San Francisco. It's it's cut off from everything on the east side of from 101. Um, there, what we did is we gave a, a parking um, cash out of four dollars a day to every single employee. So they had a choice between free parking if they drove, four dollars a day if if they took any alternative. It turned out that for a lot of them, uh, carpooling was the option. Um, walking and biking worked for some. Um, the then once the demand for um, alternatives was created by that parking cash out, then it made sense to beef up the shuttle service that, that Genentech offered. So you can use a, a similar approach um, with employers in, in an area like, say, Moffat Park. If, 
if you require that future employers moving into that area provide parking cash out, then you're really expanding choices. Um, and then similarly with, with seniors, you can do things like if you make sure that you unbundle the parking cost um, at a senior apartment complex that, that's about to be built, then what you're doing is you're simply allowing residents to decide how much parking they, they voluntarily want to buy. Um, now, some seniors will, will want to keep their car, but there are a lot of other seniors who, for example, may not be comfortable um, driving or, or um, may not be able to afford a car easily. And what they'll do then is use the money they're saving on their parking to use taxis. They may walk and bike for a lot of local errands um, and, and they may use transit as well. So basically, if you expand options for people rather than just um, thinking about it as taking things away. So Trevor F asks, in Ventura, why didn't people park in the existing garages if streets were completely full? Well, the, the, um, uh, the, the way it tended to work there was, and, and this happens in many, many areas, is that the employees would be the first people to show up in the morning because they, they get there to open up the shops. Um, so they would come down, they would take the, the two hour parking spaces on the street, the two hour time limited spaces. And then when customers showed up later in the day, it was the customers who had to go and, and um, start using the less convenient parking spaces in, in the lots and the upper floors of the garages. Um, and the, the employees tended to just go out and move their cars every couple hours. Um, so when the charging went into place, that basically flipped. The employees said, oh, you know, I'm actually going to park my car where I'm supposed to in the in the all day parking in the garage um, and stop doing that two hour shuffle. And um, that this kind of situation is really common, especially in areas where the um, time limited parking on the street is free or cheap and where um, it's also much more convenient than the off street as it almost always is so that that's really the dynamic that ex is often a problem and that you can change by charging the right price for the curb parking so unfortunately we only have time for about one more question um so anonymous asked you mentioned charging higher rates for non-residents in residential areas most non-residents in traditional residential neighborhoods are visiting residents who live there have you had issues with this in your experience with residents complaining that they need free parking for their guests as well? <laughs> yeah, yeah. And um, there's a couple ways to cope with that. So one way is to give a, a limited number of visitor permits to existing residents. And um, that that can be done the old fashioned way with a, a hang tag that you actually hang on, on your visitor's rear view mirror. But then it can be done in a more modern way by having a code that people can use to to um, they they give it to their resident. I mean, they give it to their their visitor. Their visitor punches it in when they use their their um, phone to to pay for the parking. And then the code is basically a, a free parking code that allows that. And you limit the amount of of free parking for the the visitors. Um, it's a uh, it's something where um, of course a lot of times. There are times when people will say, well, we just would rather not have to to have um, to do anything like that. But for a lot of neighborhoods, especially neighborhoods that already have a spillover parking problem, the the inconvenience of having to do um, something to actually uh, manage your parking is greatly outweighed by the fact that you no longer have spillover problems and you won't have any. And also by the fact that um, you're now able to get some revenue for your neighborhood. Um, and also, once you people start to realize that doing this is what allows you to really limit the amount of traffic that comes down your street going to and from downtown. Unfortunately, it looks like we're about at time. I really wish we could answer all of these questions because there are some great ones still remaining, um, but I also want to be mindful of everyone's time. So to wrap everything up, thank you again to Patrick and Michelle 
Um, as we can see by the amount of questions coming in, it was obviously a, um, a great presentation that gave everyone a lot to think about. Um, and to everyone who is attending, I want to remind you to please fill out our evaluation. It's posted in the um, published Q&A chat, and we will also be emailing it out to you after the event. Um, filling out these evaluations really helps us to plan our other speaker series events and it will definitely help us as we move forward and plan to do more webinars. Um, so with that, thank you again to everyone who attended and who presented and I hope everyone has a great night. Thanks Emma, thanks for hosting. It's been a pleasure. Yeah, no problem. <laughs> Bye all. And